all it remains for me to do is to introduce the, the person you've all come to see tonight. Um, that's Tony Hawkes. Um, Tony's been entertaining me with his books and his um, other, other works for, for many years. Uh, those of you who I'm sure you all do, do know about Tony, but of course has written a number of best-selling books, appears regularly on various shows on Radio 4 and on television and so on. Um, in connection with Action for Happiness, we were delighted that he, he sort of signed up to join the movement um, as one of our very earliest supporters. And on the day we were launching this, I was on Radio 5 talking on the Nicky Campbell show about what we were launching. And um, Nicky Campbell had been desperately trying to sort of rally some people who were sort of naysayers about this whole idea and sort of trying to suggest that there were, it was sort of somehow um, a ridiculous idea. And uh, Tony Hawks came on the line and said, oh, our friend Tony's on. Let's get Tony's opinion on this. I think expecting Tony to to sort of um, give an alternative perspective. And Tony said, it's a brilliant idea. We should definitely be doing more of this. Um, so I've liked Tony very much ever since that, that moment. <laughs> um, but Tony is going to share with us his, his, um, his own story and, of course, bring that to life in his own unique way. But, of course, lots of the messages that underpin his journey link back very much to the themes that we, we care so much about with our movement. So I hope this is going to be an entertaining evening, a kind of inspiring evening, and also one that makes us all think a little bit as well as laugh quite a lot. So please join me putting your hands together and welcoming our guest this evening, Tony Hawkes. Thank you very much. I've just been sitting in a little room there, a rather sad figure at the back. But anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, no, I, when I started out as a performer, um, I, I sort of learnt my trade, if you like, playing quite tough comedy clubs up and down the country to people who drank too much, who were tired, and, 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 and it was tough. Uh, and I'm pleased to say I've progressed to playing to a group of people who are keen for everybody in the world to be happy. Um, so if I get heckled off tonight, it'll be quite disappointing for my ego. Um, so fingers crossed that won't happen. Just want to clarify before I go any further, this is quite important. Um, if, well, just let's ask, has anybody come here tonight expecting to see Tony Hawk, the skateboarder? Okay, yes, well, uh, you may be uh, disappointed. Um, this does happen to me quite a lot. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Tony Hawk is, I think, probably you know, established as being one of the best skateboarders in the world, if not the best skateboarder in the world. And he's brought out lots of games based on skateboarding that are particularly, pop particularly popular with American youth. Uh, and unfortunately for me, he's named his skateboarding games after himself and used the apostrophe. So he's Tony Hawk, I'm Tony Hawks, but his game is called Tony Hawks Pro Skater with the apostrophe. But unfortunately, American youth haven't grasped the concept of the apostrophe. <laughs> with enough zeal, really, for my liking. Uh, much in the same way as footballers haven't really embraced the concept of the adverb. Um, and, and so I get all is, or certainly used to, less so now, but for about five years, I used to get about seven or eight emails a week from kids asking me how to do a 909 or an ollie. And I got fed up of this, so I started writing replies to them. And I just want to sort of share some of the replies, just a few, just as a little warm-up before we get into things. Some of my favorite little replies to this. Um, so when I'm facing this way, I'll be the skateboarder. And when I'm this way, I'll, I'll be me. It's a little theatrical device I'm going to use. <laughs> hey, Tony, what is better, a long board or a short board? From Chris. Dear Chris, a long board if you're cutting a big loaf. <laughs> and a short one if you're mainly dealing with scones and such like. <laughs> Tony, how hard was it to do the 900? Justin. Justin, quite hard, especially since around 750 of them said no at first. I needed to be very persuasive before I could do the full 900. <laughs> Hi, Tony. I was wondering if you could find some cheats for Pro Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, William. William, the best cheat is to go to a store, find Pro Skater 3, and then leave the shop without paying for it. <laughs> if they catch you, just say that I said it was okay. 
Dear Tony, will Florida be included in any of your touring events? If so, which cities? Thanks, your best friend, Willie. <laughs> Willie, Florida no, Bexhill Hill on Sea, yes. <laughs> P.S. You're not my best friend. Unusually, my best friend is someone who I know. <laughs> and who has pubic hair. Dear Tony, I just wanted to say thanks for taking the time out to sign our son's skateboard. Andrew, our son, and Mark, his father, were the ones waiting for you at the hotel in Washington, D.C. It meant a lot to Andrew. He said, you're really nice. He said, you said, no worries, dude. He'll never forget it. Mark and Andrea. Dear Mark and Andrea, I'm delighted to learn that saying something as superficial as no worries, dude, can leave people convinced that I'm a great chap. <laughs> Things have generally picked up for me since I started saying that, instead of piss off and leave me alone. <laughs> Which is what I'm really thinking. <laughs> Dear Tony Hawk, I hate you, you know why, because my wish is about you coming to my city and my wish do not come, so I like you before, but now I hate you, Zach. <laughs> Dear Zach, this is not as disappointing for me as you might think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. But when I was asked to do this, I, I thought, what am I going to talk about? You know, I, I got a philosophy of life, and it's a pretty happy one. And I've done a lot of things over the last 10 years. And, but there was one thing particularly that, that kicked off the way I think about life. And I want to talk about that. It's this adventure I had around Ireland with a fridge. It won't leave my life. And, and you'll, hopefully you'll see tonight why that's a good thing. So I want to talk about it uh, uh, in hopefully a fun way. Tell the story again. I hope some of you may have heard it a little bit before. Hopefully not. Hopefully this will be giving you a new aspect to it. Things that, that weren't in the book. A few pictures that you may not have seen. Uh, a little, and, and then afterwards, I just want to sort of tell, uh, basically, give you the lessons I learned from it. Then you could go away, have a think about them, and then also Mark's going to come back on the stage and sort of grill me a little bit about some other things, that, that some other ideas that I've got in my head that I don't yet know how to present in, in a way unless somebody asks me about them. That's, that's my theory anyway. I, uh, he, he, he sort of said, why don't you talk about that? And I thought, oh, I don't know how to talk about that. Just come and ask me, and then I'll probably talk about it. Um, that's probably got you quite worried now, anyway. Uh, but anyway, then we will have questions at the end, so anything that comes up, feel free to, to join in. But the, the biggest question I always get asked uh, is, it's an obvious one, you know, why did I... In 1997, in May, hitchhike round Ireland with a fridge. It's covered uh, in, in the book, but I can't just say to everybody, go and buy the book. Um, although that is quite a good thing for them to do. Um, but basically, what happened? The truth, the truth behind it is the first time I went to Ireland, uh, I kind of can't even remember when it was, but I went to Ireland for a song competition. I had a song, in a, in a song competition in Cavan in the north of Southern Ireland. And I was picked up at the airport. Um, by an Irish guy and driven to this place. And after about half an hour of this journey, the light was fading and by the side of the road, I saw this solitary figure. And it was an old boy and he was hitching with a big fridge next to him. And I said to the bloke that was hitching me, you know, hitching, sorry, that was driving me, I said, you know, was that bloke hitching with a fridge? And he went, oh yeah. And he never said another word about it. And, <laughs> And I thought, Ireland is an extraordinary place that hitching with a fridge isn't even a conversation point. <laughs> um, and so this stuck with me, this stuck in my head, this image, this character. And years later, quite a few years later, I was at a dinner party, told this story, uh, and I had quite a lot of wine, and ended up saying, well, of course, Ireland is the one place in the world where you could hitch with a fridge. You know, people over there are cool, about, and they, they'd give you a lift. Anyway, got into an argument, Long and short of it is I made a hundred pound bet with my friend Kevin that I could do this. Now, I woke up the next day and I realized, you know, I didn't need a hundred pound that much, you know. I didn't have to go and do this. But I kept waking in the middle of the night in the following weeks thinking, 
I should do this, you know, I should really, you know, do it. So it was almost, it's by personal tragedy, you could argue, because some people have a calling to lead men to freedom or to fight injustice. It seemed to be my pathetic calling seemed to be to put a fridge by the side of the road and start hitching in Ireland. So anyway, I decided to do it. Um, and it got off to a suitably weird beginning because my plan was to, to fly out on a Sunday, start on a Monday morning. And the Saturday night before I was going to leave, I was asked to perform at the Prince's Trust Royal Gala at the Manchester Opera House. And they said, come and do just 10 minutes of stand-up. And uh, so I thought, OK, I'll go and do that, and then I'll leave. I'll fly from Manchester to Dublin, which is perfectly uh, reasonable. So I, I, I did this uh, performance. Uh, and then after you do these shows, interestingly, this was the evening that Beckham, David Beckham, met Posh Spice, because they, the, they were both on the bill, and they met each other that, that evening. And, and the run, so they had the whole Manchester United team on stage, and basically, there's a pecking order. There's a show business pecking order. The more famous you are, any kind of royal gala, the more centre stage you are. This wasn't particularly good for me because I was right out in the wings when we had to bow. Uh, and we did a rehearsal. When I had to eventually, at the end of the evening, bow to Prince Charles, I was bowing directly into the wings where a stagehand was just going like that to me. <laughs> Which wasn't the best, you know... Uh, <laughs> Best thing for your ego that you could do. And then you have to line up, and Prince Charles comes around and talks to you each one by one. And he had about three questions for everyone. And, and he got to me. And I wasn't really that interested in sort of playing this rather silly game, I thought, really. So I wasn't very forthcoming. And he, he said, you know, how did you find the audience? And I said, they, they were OK. <laughs> so he thought, try another tack. He said, did, did you have to come far? And I said, not really, London. And then he said, and what are you up to next? <laughs> and I said, I'm hitchhiking round Ireland with a fridge, Your Majesty. <laughs> At which point he thought I was taking the piss and just moved on to someone else. Um, but I did. I wasn't taking the piss. I did go. The next morning I flew off. And what had seemed like a fun concept, uh, an idea I'd had a laugh about with people in the pub, the reality kicked in. As, as Monday morning I got a bus out of Dublin with a little fridge that I'd bought, half-size fridge, and got off the bus, stood by the side of the road, whoop, walked up, had it on a little trolley, and began. And drizzle started, rain began. And any of you that have travelled alone will know that I think when you travel alone, you can have mood swings much quicker than if you're with someone else. And I went from quite happy to thoroughly depressed within about 15 minutes because cars were shooting by, they weren't stopping, and I was just getting wetter and wetter. And, and this seemed to me just, in that moment I was thinking, I've allowed a month for this. I'm going to be going home in about 25 minutes. This doesn't work. Um, but I went to a, a little pub that was nearby because it was raining very hard, had a couple of pints of uh, Guinness, and got Dutch courage, basically, chatted to some people, came back out. It was another half an hour. It was still going nowhere, mood going down. And, and eventually, a little old boy pulled up in a van, uh, a dilapidated van, and, and he was, seemed to be offering me a lift. And I, I tried to establish how far he was going, because those of you that have hitched will know that sometimes it's not a good idea to take a hitch if it's just going to take you, like, 100 yards or something. And this bloke, I couldn't understand anything I was, <laughs> he was saying to me. He couldn't understand anything I was saying. And he just got so annoyed with me. He just said, throw the feckin' thing in the back with you, just pointing to the fridge. And he said, is that a fridge? And I said, yes. He said, well, you wouldn't want to be travelling with that for too long now, would you? Um, and, then, and then God spoke. <laughs> yeah. OK. But is that, is that um, is, should we switch mics? Because it seems... Oh, that, that, there's a little. There is a man there. I'm not just pretending. There's this. <laughs> oh, there. There's a man. He, he look, a man who looks annoyingly happy from my point of view. Um, it sound. It does sound a bit boomy though. You, I know you're giving me that and everything. Does it sound a bit boomy and funny to you? I think. If, do you have another mic? I, I, I mean, I know it's good to mine, but I think they know something's wrong. <laughs> you could come out because they might want to boo. I mean, no cheer. So he's. Um, oh, hello. This is Andy, give him a round of applause, because actually, to be fair to Andy, we're, one of the reasons we're running late is because my laptop broke, and Andy did everything to fix it. Let's, let's try and not turn on 
an evening with Andy and Tony. That sounds all right. Is that better? Great, OK. Right, so, uh, yeah, so I, this bloke had given me this lift, finally, this little old boy. And, and he, he, he did, actually, only take me about three miles up the road. And we were I was sitting in the van with him, and uh, I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm just going to a cattle auction. And I said, are you going to buy a cow? And he said, no, I'm just going to kill time. Um, and suddenly I felt a long way from home. You know, I was, place where somebody goes to a cattle auction. I was really out of my depth here, and he dropped me at this cattle auction. It was the worst place in the Northern Hemisphere to hitch. Uh, and I was in it again, stuck, the, the mood dipped. And finally, a bloke pulled up, uh, and he wound down the window, and he said, oh, geez, I've been looking for you. Um, and now the background to this is, I didn't tell you this, I should have perhaps told you, that the Sunday night when I arrived in Dublin, I checked into a bed and breakfast place, met somebody I knew in Dublin for a drink that night, and they happened to say, why don't you tell the Jerry Ryan show about what you're doing? I said, what's the Jerry Ryan show? So it's a little radio show. Jerry loves these kind of wacky ideas. I'm sure he'd like to chat to you. So I, I happened to be staying in Donnybrook, which is opposite the RTE studios, or very close. So I dropped a little note in that night before I went to the guest house and left the number. And sure enough, they rang me in the morning and uh, it's, it's very Irish in a way, because in, in, in UK, perhaps if you've dropped a line into a producer about a possible idea, yeah, they might get back to you four or five days later. Well, they rang immediately, woke me up and said, you're on after the next record, you know. So <laughs> I, I was just chatting half asleep to Jerry Ryan, told him what I was up to. And he said, Tony, it sounds like a completely purposeless idea, but a damn fine one. Um, and he said, you know, chat to us every few days and uh, let us know how you're getting on. Now, this bloke who'd stopped had heard this and had listened out to where I was starting and had actually taken a different route so he could try and give me a lift. So it was fantastic. <laughs> so uh, at that point, the thing really started to kick off. And I thought, now, this guy was called Brendan. He was a toiletry salesman. Uh, now, one of the other things that, that I've done with this story, as well as originally writing the book, is uh, we made a film uh, which came out last year and was on BBC4 a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and a few bits in, this, in the film are, are virtually lifted directly out of real life, and it's nice. And, and Brendan was played by Sean Hughes in the film. And, and so I just want to show a minute from the film because it's pretty much like what happens. So fingers crossed that this works okay. There's probably also a couple of other slides that I didn't talk about that I meant to show you. There's, there's, that's the sort of, that's me happily hitching. That was a, the reality was it on the morning, you know, I was there, a very bare road. If you can imagine it rain, as we can see, tiny little fridge. And you could imagine standing there, and if, if nobody was stopping, just what an idiot you would feel. Um, but finally, anyway, uh, Brendan did stop, and, and this, is what happened, fingers crossed. I saw you about half an hour ago when I was going the other way towards Kells, and I thought, what is that white thing he's hitching with? A fridge, a fridge. What an item to be hitching with. Yeah, I'm doing it to win a bet. You're kidding me. No, I made it when I was drunk. <laughs> oh God, the things we do when we're drunk. <laughs> if Mary and I hadn't gotten drunk, we'd never have gotten it together. Is she your wife? It's yeah, someone else's. Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun while it lasted. But that's what counts, isn't it? It's like you and your bet. You could have backed out of it, but you didn't. You heard that little voice inside your head telling you to do it. That, my friend, is your intuition. <laughs> if I hadn't listened to that little voice inside my head, I'd have never gotten into toiletries. Isn't there a main road that'll take us to Cavern? There is. And isn't that quicker? Well, that depends on what way you look at it. The spurs are on this road, that's true. But I think it's quicker because it's more beautiful. The first thing that we did was we stopped and he invited me uh, to have a drink and, 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 and this actually became the main sort of motif of my journey. Here is, this is a picture that sums it up really, which is just drink out of focus. Um, 
just that's what I sort of looked at at the end of most of my evenings on this trip. Um, it, you know, I mean, some people have done great adventures and, and things like this, and, and people think, oh, it was amazing that you did that. They didn't realise really what I did was just get a lift with people, you know, go to a pub and then drink a lot with them uh, and happen to remember enough to write it down. And um, I recorded them as well, so I was able to, to write it down. But there was a great thing. My theory was... I'll just get a lift, I'll go to a, a wherever, roughly where I get, a few hours in, I'll go to the first pub I find, I'll put my fridge down by the bar stool, uh, I'll have a pint of Guinness and I'll see what happens. Uh, and it was amazing, because what tended to happen were well, most of the pubs that you'd go in mid-afternoon would have one bloke who was sort of slumped over the table somewhere or at the bar. Uh, it was almost like they had a kind of resident drunk who was employed to give the place the right feel, I think. <laughs> Uh, and the, the rule was, they could, any drink that they could still say, they could have for nothing. Um, so there were quite a few of these. And, but generally what would happen is that I'd, I'd go in, order a pint, sit down, and two or three old boys would just sort of look at this thing, you know, and, and stare at it. But they were very, didn't like to pry. So it would be about 20 minutes, and then one of them would sort of be pushed by the others to go over and say, you know, and they'd come over to me and they'd say, is that a fridge? And I'd say, yes. And then they'd just go and sit back down again. And then another 15 minutes would pass, another pint, and then another one would come over and say something like, what the feck are you doing with a fridge? And I'm saying, well, I'm doing it to win a bet. And they'd say, well, how much was a bet? And I'd say, 100 pounds. And say, so they'd say, how much was a fridge? And I'd say, 120 pounds. <laughs> and they'd say, geez, you're an idiot. What are you drinking? <laughs> And this, I really do firmly believe this about the Irish sense of humour and the Irish generally, is that they could not do enough for me once they knew that the bet was utterly pointless and stupid. <laughs> I think if they'd thought I'd been raising money for charity, they would have been nice to me, but they loved the fact that I'd spent more on the fridge than the bet was for. Um, and this opened up the doors to this enormous hospitality that I experienced. Uh, here's an example of a, of a character. There was one situation, in this pub, the, the fridge had been down on the floor, and the landlord wouldn't have it. You know, he said, no, come on, put it on a bar stool. Let it join in with everybody else. So, uh, <laughs> a fridge, fridge, and it rather flummoxed this bloke here, who was sort of, sort of looking at it for quite some time. And eventually, he just looked up and said, oh, geez, it's nice to see it out of context. Uh, so it's just a, a wonderful way, way with words, really. Um, so um, I then made it up to Tory Island, or near Tory. This is Donegal, a beautiful part of the world. And one of the parts of the bits of the bet that I had to do, I had to get out to Tory Island in the northwest. Uh, the deal I did with Kevin, who I made the bet with, he said, you can have a half-size fridge if you go to all the extremities of Southern Ireland. So uh, I went, had to get to Tory Island, and, and I was a little bit unlucky when I got there. It's, it's just off the, this map, actually, just up there, Tory. Um, it might be there, but I've lost confidence suddenly, which is, I've only been talking about this for 10 years, should know this by now. Anyway, pretty certain it's, it's I don't know, anyway. Um, it's, it's an island somewhere off island. It has a king as well, which I thought was a rather cute idea. So I was keen to going to, to Tory, and I wanted to meet the king. But the ferry wasn't running, uh, and it had been repaired in a place called Killy Beggs. So I was supposed to wait two weeks. And I thought, oh, God, how unlucky is that? Uh, but subsequently to, to doing this, I had a, quite an adventure having to try and get out there. And so what turned out to be really bad news at the time turned out to be really good news for me because it was a really good couple of chapters once I decided to write a book about it. And since, since then, I've realized whenever anything, something seemingly bad happens, you can give another spin on it because the worst scenario is you can learn something from it. So eventually, I hitched my way out. And here, I, I've got some flour. I got a lift with this uh, nice Gaelic-speaking... Um, Fisherman. No, uh, no, interesting, just a thought occurred to me. I was sort of hanging out with these guys. Just, they're just talking Gaelic. They, they talk, the only thing, there's no Gaelic word for fuck. So they're just talking absolute gobbledygook and swearing in English, which is, a, which is an incredible. It sounds like they're only talking about that all the time. It's amazing. Anyway, um, the daughter, uh, I heard that the king of Tory 
had a daughter, and uh, so I thought if I take some flowers, I can try and uh, marry into royalty. That was the end of that was my little gag that I thought was hilarious. Anyway, I got there, the daughter wasn't there, uh, a storm was coming in, but this is the King of Tory who I, I met. Patsy Dan, a very nice man, and we, we only had time for a cup of tea because, as I say, a storm was coming in, and you can get stuck on that island for as long as two weeks if the, the weather turns awful. There's about 60 people on the island, and that's it, and he is the king. It's a tradition they have. We had a cup of tea in his lovely little, very modest little home. He had a little line, and he just said as we were leaving, he said, I may be the poorest king on earth, but I'm a happy one. And he seemed to be it, really. And as I, as I thought of, the, at that time, the sort of misery of the royal family that we had that would seem to be sort of tearing each other apart. And the simplicity of his life uh, seemed rather wonderful. And then the fridge continued to be uh, talked about in the press. The Irish press picked up on this because they heard it on Jerry Ryan. Uh, people wanted to do photo calls, asked me to get out of the picture so that... Uh, 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 you know, which is again disappointing for me, really. Uh, the, the fridge did make the front page of Francheur, I think, of which is the Gaelic newspaper. There it is, the fridge there. Not that much news happening that, that week. Um, and uh, yes, I was on Live at Three, which was a, a radio, uh, to a TV actually, an Irish TV station. For some reason, they wanted to talk to me. They, they, they came and got me actually, and then took me back to where I was because I had a mobile unit going. And this was actually in uh, Northern Ireland, which there was no peace at the time. I didn't hitch through Northern Ireland because I was told people at that point wouldn't stop for hitches. The army were around. They thought it could be blown up in a controlled explosion by the side of the road if the army was suspicious it was a bomb. Anyway, so this was in... Um, uh, and they, uh, I'm not sure whether they played a trick on me. They interviewed me and they said, walk on down the road there and then start hitching and we'll film you in the distance hitching whilst we finish the program off. So I did, I walked down there and, and there's, there I am hitching under the sign and at the top of the sign, I don't know whether you can read it, it says, Sniper at Work. <laughs> <laughs> and basically the IRA put this up and just to sort of and every night the British army took it down and every night sorry every morning the British army took it down every every night the IRA put it back up and they just left it there in the end and they left me hitching with a sniper at work sign there and the the girl that interviewed me Antoinette she drove me back to where I was staying in in Bun uh, yeah it, actually not in Bunbeg in um Sligo, Strand Hill, and we had to try and find some accommodation for the night. Now, we've got a little clip coming up. Let's just pick it up and see if we can get this. Well. All the hotels are full up. What did I tell you? Right, come on. We're going to have to figure out what to do with you, but first. What's that? It's a duck egg. How much is it? What do you want a duck egg for? I don't know, I just like the look of it. How much is it? Don't be so silly. You don't want a duck egg. I do. I, I want to buy this duck egg off you. No, you don't. I do. Now, come on. What would you want with a duck egg? Well, I like the look of it. Never mind about duck eggs. You should be trying to find a hotel. Something will turn up. No? You couldn't even buy an egg when you wanted to. Yeah, well, I worked out what happened there. Oh. He was a wise man in that, Delhi. He knew I didn't really want a duck egg, so he didn't want to sell it to me. He's there to give people what they want, not what they don't want. And what is it that you want? I want to hitchhike round the island with a fridge. Why? I mean, really? Cut the bullshit. Once there was an old man who wanted to get his fridge home. So he put it down by the side of the road, stuck his thumb out, and had faith that someone would come along and help him. You too can have faith in the fridge. Yeah. Come on. Still got Don't just come, come on. Oh. This gin 
genuinely did happen, this little scene in the... In, and I became sort of fixated with this thing that happened in Sligo, where I went into this delicatessen, and uh, Antoinette wanted to buy some sort of seaweed called Dillisk, and she was off looking for it. And I got involved in this exchange with this bloke, you know, asking him how much a duck egg, and he completely refused to sell this duck egg to me. And I was sort of saying, no, I want to buy it. He said, no, you, wouldn't. no you don't want a duck egg. No, don't be so silly. And I thought it was, it was fantastic, because... Actually, when we went back to, to film, uh, so we were going to try and film in the same place. As it turned out, it was too narrow. We couldn't, we couldn't fit in there. We couldn't do it. But his, uh, his son was in the, the shop. And I went in and asked for a duck egg and, and sort of went through this regime. And he went, I know who you are. And uh, he said, we, when that book came out, we thought, is this this shop? And then when, when we heard what the bloke was saying, we knew it was dad. You know, so... Um, <laughs> So he was obviously like this with everyone. But I think the, the lesson of it was, which I thought it was just such a nice antidote to the world that I came from and the world where, where a lot of us inhabit, where people are trying to sell you things you don't want. You know, they're trying to push them on. Some of us, some poor people, have to do that as a job. They have to try and say, you want this. I mean, what is advertising all about other than trying to make you want something you don't want? And this bloke wouldn't sell me something when I was trying to buy it off him because he knew it wasn't what I didn't really want. And I thought, tiny little moment, fantastic nugget of incredible wisdom. And uh, anyway, so we crack on. There it is. That's the, the thing I started to develop, this silly little expression that Antoinette thought was so silly. And it didn't really mean anything, still doesn't. But it, it got me into a ludicrously positive frame of mind in a sort of artificial way. I'd just say, everything will be all right. The fridge will sort it out. And people started to run with it, this silly idea. And I ended up in a, in a pub, uh, and we were talking about... Um, the, the, we went... Actually, Antoinette, that night, I should tell you this little story, which is quite nice, is... Um, she dropped me off. We were going to go to meet for a drink in the evening. So I went into my guest house. She picked me up later. And uh, I came out and she said, uh, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm coming for a drink. She said, well, where's the fridge? And I said, well, I've, I've left it in the room. And she said, come on, it's a Friday night. You can't leave it in on its own. <laughs> So we had to take the fridge to the pub with us and we, we took the fridge in and all the things started to happen around the fridge and people started laughing and drink was happening and, and everything like this. And um, this bloke came up to me and he said, I just want to thank you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I want to thank you. Look at all the faces of the people all around. And we looked around and he said, they're all smiling and they're laughing at your fridge. He said, you're spreading joy. And uh, in a way, I thought at that moment, maybe there was some logic to this whole stupid thing. That, that, that it was my job, if you will, my way of being of service, just like the bloke with the duck egg who was there to give people what they wanted. Maybe that was how I could do my little bit. So I carried on doing that. And the bloke who ran the pub uh, was a bloke called Bingo, and he was a champion surfer. And I genuinely wanted to have a go at surfing. I'd never surfed. And he said he could get me up on a board in the morning. Uh, and then this little old boy overheard this and said, well, it wouldn't be right for you to do it, Tony, and for the fridge not to go and join in. <laughs> and a genuine conversation uh, broke out and discussion about whether you could get a fridge up on a surfboard or not. Um, and it was decided that the fridge's center of gravity was one of its strong points. You know, uh, <laughs> It was decided they, they wouldn't panic in the wave of, you know, in the, in the light of a difficult wave. Um, so it was decided that in the morning we'd try and get the fridge surfing. And I thought this was just a drink talking. But in the morning, 11 o'clock, we met up. Bingo was there, had a wetsuit for me, said we're going to give it a go. And uh, we set off. And here, here we are. He got, the, he got the better part of the deal, really, having the surfboard. I'm struggling with a fridge. Um, and we started to... Uh, this is it. This is the, me sort of waiting for a wave to, to come along. It was fairly calm, but every now and again you get a wave of waves. There's probably a better way of putting that. Um, and it, I have to say, it was at this point of this journey that I decided I would have to write a book about it. Uh, I'd, I'd sort of done it. I thought it might make a radio program. I thought it might make a, an article in a Sunday newspaper. But when I was in the sea with the fridge on a surfboard and a bit of an audience building on, on the shore. 
I thought, this, you'd have to pinch yourself to believe that this was really happening. So the idea was that I would let go of the fridge at, at the right key point and it would ride in and the, the bingo would catch it. Um, and there I am, that's a moment of let, letting it go. And sure enough, it did ride in. This is a later shot of bingo. Uh, he, he actually, his job was to try and surf in on the board with it and he managed to do it as well. Here he is, he was such a good surfer. Shortly after that picture was taken, he managed to stand up like this, and he, he looked so cool. He thought he could. He, I actually thought he could reach down and take an ice cold drink out of the fridge, and, and carry on. And everyone applauded at the end of, of that. And then the fridge, for a while, just sort of, sort of glowed and celebrated the the, uh, the victory. And people on the shore applauded, uh, and went home to tell the story to people who thought they'd probably been on hallucinogenic drugs. Um, <laughs> But that was it. And there is a sort of minute sequence in the film which actually doesn't have much dialogue in it. So we could give that just a quicker. I should quickly tell you that the reason why I like to show this is some people don't believe that a fridge um, does actually surf or can actually surf. And when we made the film, Ed by the director said, well, what trick are we, are we going to use for this sequence? I said, Ed, we don't need to use any trickery. It works, you know, I will go into the water, we'll get the right wave, and you'll see that the fridge will go in. And there's a sequence when this does actually work, and I'm actually sort of cheering, and it looks like I'm quite a good actor at that point, but it's really because I'm just cheering at bloody Ed by, saying it would be possible, I told you it was bloody possible. Hang on, what is the plan exactly? Well, I think we should wade in, balance the fridge on board, wait for the right breaker, and... Uh... Ride her in on a decent wave. Right, well, good luck with that then. All right, Tony. Not solar sheep. They're sane. The rest of us are mad. It appears to be a fridge. A ah, fridge, is it? Will I put that in the report? Not if you want that promotion. on uh, with a, just I want to race through a few things wherever I went with the fridge there was sort of calls for a party people would get out musical instruments and celebrate it and also I was still on the lookout for the for the resident drunk I, I was pretty certain in this picture it was going to be this bloke who's attempting to play the spoons but I was actually wrong because it was the bloke behind him there he is he's gone uh, carrying on and it was it was wonderful people there was a guy in a session would start and a guy once started up playing a, a guitar that was lying around he was playing all the wrong chords uh, and I thought they were going to get really fed up with him but they didn't at all uh, they just encouraged him and part, part of the fun of it was he was taking part and I thought that was nice as well because I, I think somehow we've got lost in a society where you you have to be bloody good at doing something before you do it in a way, I'm proof that that isn't the case tonight. Um, but I think the thing is, we don't, sometimes we don't, I, I've been, I don't know whether you have, you've been with somebody and you kind of say, oh, play, you play a bit of guitar, play, and they say, oh, I'm no good, I can't do it. Well, this bloke was terrible. Uh, and he played and had a bloody good time, and that, was, that seemed to be what everyone seemed to, to care about most, which is good. This bloke just was the most drunk man I'd ever seen in the world. Uh, he just came up to me, and it was, and there was. A, I was trying to watch, uh, along with everyone else in this pub, the, the English Cup final was on, and they they do like watching that over there for some reason. And uh, he was in the middle of the screen, right in front of it at one point. It looked like he was having an epileptic fit, uh, but it turned out he just said, oh, "Eat your heart out, Michael Flatley," uh, and he was doing Irish dancing, and. Uh, 
everybody sort of cheered and clapped him and laughed and it was uh, there seemed to be a great tolerance going on and uh, maybe I just had lived this sort of through this little fridge adventure you know I didn't see any of the darkness that might have surrounded some of these lives it was just a the celebration but I took from it what I could um, and and it was decided that the fridge needed a name uh, and you know I said well I don't know what sex it is uh, and they said well you know we'll we'll give it the name of a, of a, of a unisex name so Searsha uh, is the Gaelic uh, which could be a girl or a boy's name for freedom so we christened it this is the christening outside the pub Matt Malloy's in uh, Westport uh, and then after we'd christened the fridge, they said, now you'll have to get it blessed. Uh, and I said, well, how will I do that? They said, go to Kylemore Abbey. It has a visitor center. Take it in there. There'll be a nun there. Ask for the mother superior and she'll bless it. You know, <laughs> piece of piss, really. So uh, I did exactly that. Wheeled the fridge into the visitor center. Sure enough, there was a nun there called Sister Magdalena. I said, I'd like the mother superior to bless my fridge. And she said, hold on. I'll just go and get it for you. No problem. <laughs> uh, and she did, she came down and then she, <laughs> she, she, <laughs> she wrote, God bless you, Searsha, on the fridge and invited me for, for dinner and I stayed for dinner. And this is Sister Magdalena. And then after dinner, she gave me a lift into the little village nearby and I sneezed because I got a bit of a cold from being in the sea so much for the surfing. And she said, bless you. And I thought, how nice to hear that from someone who was fully qualified. Uh, and... This is it, this is subsequent, this isn't that this is a beautiful view, me sitting in the fridge. It was subsequent, Harp Irish Lager asked me to do a little advert for them, so I sat with this, and that was the fridge, obviously, being an advert, it had to be not true, so they tripled the size of the fridge. But I, I, what happened is shortly after that, I did sit by a lake in Killarney with the fridge, looking out, thinking, what is happening here? You know, I am having the most extraordinary adventure. Uh, and I, and I thought, well, I wonder if you could run an analogy here, that this fridge journey could be a metaphor for life. And I came up with a little theory as I sat there, that Dublin was birth, that was where I was starting, and Dublin was going to be death, because that was where I was going to finish. But I had to make this journey in between. But there really wasn't very much point for it, a point in it. I'd paid £100 for uh, 120 pounds for a fridge to try and win a 100 pound bet. So the only point in it, in a way, was to make it an enjoyable experience. And, and since then, I've tried to live my life like that. In a way, try to live every day like that. You know, what is the point in it? You could try and work it out, really. We could, we could keep doing that till we're blue in the face. But actually, it's a journey, and you've got to make it an enjoyable experience. And then I started to stretch this hitchhiking analogy further, actually, because there's something really rather beautiful in hitching. Um, it's something that we don't see much of anymore. Uh, when I was little, I think I used to see, we'd drive off as, on family and to go to places, and we'd see hitchhikers by the side of the road. We don't see it now. I think we've been given a terrible disservice by Hollywood and television because seemingly, you know, whenever you see a hitchhiker in any bit of drama, they're either going to kill the driver or the driver will kill them, basically. <laughs> That's a rule of drama, really. And, you know, it's not true. I've, I've only killed three men myself, so uh, it's not true. So it's a shame, though, if you think about it, they're going the same way as you. Why wouldn't they stop and give you a lift and help you and have a nice chat? It's a, it's a terrible shame. We've shut down our worlds. The car is, a, is symbolic, in a way, of what we've become. You know, the door shuts, in we are, you're out there, I'm in here, I'm on my own. It's Thatcherism encapsulated in a little vehicle, isn't it, really? <laughs> there it is, I've got this, it's bloody good, actually nicer than yours, and I'm going. Anyway, so I thought, you know, hitchhiking taught me a few things, because the one thing you can't do with hitching is be sure of where you're going to be at the end of the day. So when Antoinette was saying to me, you know, where are you going to stay tonight? Where are you going to stop? I, when they originally wanted me to do this interview, they said, well, where, you know, they called me up on the phone and they said, where are you going to be on Friday? And I said, I don't know. 
And they said, well, you must know. I said, I don't know where I'm going to be. It's, and it was fantastic. I'd left a life behind where you had to diarise everything, you had to know everything. And I just felt this enormous weight lifted. I didn't know where I was going to be. And I think the way you can extend that into your lives is that, yes, we all need to plan a certain amount and we need to do certain things. But I've certainly met friends of mine who kind of think, you know, I want to be here in two years. I want to achieve this with this job. I want that to be happening. I want this number of... You don't know anyway. You've got absolutely no idea. And you just... It's something good about saying, I don't know. I don't know. Something will happen. And I'll just... You know, have faith in the fridge. <laughs> so anyway, that's another thing. You don't worry about where you're going to be. If you want to be somewhere at a certain time, you certainly don't hitch. And I was hitching on this journey. So I think the whole point of doing that was to let go of all worries. You know, I'd be somewhere. I was putting my trust in other people to help me. And actually, I do think other people do help you. And I think the fact that you're all here shows that you're in tune with that to some extent. That's one of the messages I think Action for Happiness has, that actually helping other people is good for them. So you're doing somebody a favour when you let them help you, in a way. Um, so that was one of the other things. And there were a couple of other... I mean, obviously, I, w I won't go on about it too long because I'm conscious of the time, and I know Mark wants me to talk about some other things as well. But I think... That I think we probably all know the message of the King of Tory. You know, we need less than we think we do. The happiness he got from that, and the the duck egg man was another one. Um, and I think that probably the the biggest thing I got from it was this this idea that the I had this silly saying, faith in the fridge or whatever it was, just this positive thing. Because I had it, I think it made the journey different. I think if I, obviously, I think you don't need to be a rocket science to work out if I'd wheel the fridge into a, into a pub and sort of hung my head, you know, with, with, in gloom at the bar, looking miserable, probably the different things would have, would have, you know, it just happened because I had this, luckily for me, this, I was on this ludicrous high, partly created by the experience, that meant it magnified it. Things got better because I was in this positive frame of mind. And, and it gave me the idea that in a way you are the creator of your own happiness. You are doing it. It's up to you. You can't sort of just blame the world in a way. Sometimes it's very difficult to get into that state where you're feeling positive. But when you do, things multiply. Uh, and it, it, it was incredible. I had a month of it. And I came back to England and I couldn't replicate it. I tried, but it was just one extraordinary month of having to pinch yourself and just sort of sailing on this, this high. Um, and I suppose the other thing, it had a ludicrous ending as well. Trying to do a triumphal entry into Dublin. I arranged it with Jerry Ryan. And the plan was that everyone would turn up with a domestic appliance of their choice uh, <laughs> and join me on a march through Dublin. And, and they said, we'll all meet under this clock at 11 o'clock. And I was listening in the radio of the car as I was travelling up to there. And he, Jerry Ryan was sort of, had a roving reporter on the ground. And he was saying, ah, oh, there are hordes of people here to meet Tony. And it just sounded amazing. And I got there, and there was this bloke and a bloke with a mop. Uh, <laughs> and a bagpipe player that the radio station had booked. And that was it. Um, and we marched through Dublin... And this bloke was saying, and there are hundreds and thousands of people here, ladies and gentlemen, cheering Tony on. And it was amazing. Again, it was like, a, it was like the story encapsulated because it was what you made of it. And uh, the people must have been listening that I'd met along the way, thinking, yes, listen to that. But in reality, nobody in Dublin gave a fuck about the thing, really. Um, and I thought, well, you know, initially marginally disappointed, but in the end I thought it was even more of a triumph that nobody had turned up, really. So I think the other thing I learned was don't take it all so seriously, really. I mean, it is the one thing we do know. Dublin's going to be birth and Dublin's going to be death and some stuff is going to happen in between. And if we can lighten it a bit by just going, well, we, our mortality is our friend, really, because... It's going to happen to all of us, and we're, we're unlikely 
to look back if we're if we're lucky enough to to get on a deathbed where we can sort of sit with people and look back at our lives we're, we're unlikely to say you know what I really wish I'd worried a bit more when I was 32 I really wish I'd got more stressed out about that situation when I was 44 I could have I could have got a bigger rash um <laughs> We wouldn't do that. We, we wouldn't do it. We'd pick out other things. We'd pick out what well, would be interesting exercise. Pick out the things that you would do, and then make them uh, perhaps the focus of where you are. So that is uh, really my ramble on that. I'm not not going anywhere, but I think um, that uh, ends that formal bit. And uh, as I'll welcome Mark back up to the stage now. Thank you. Tony, thank you. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny story. It's also a story that then prompted you to write a book, yeah. Hitchhike, The Fridgehiker's Guide to Life, which yes. of course then has the story inter intertwined with some of your reflections on it. Um, one of the things that I've heard you speaking about a lot is this idea of, of, of generosity and how actually um, yeah. when we do more for others, it kind of lightens it. I mean, have you, uh, uh, has, this, has this changed the way you approach your life in terms of the way you think about your role as a comedian, as an author, as about the way you kind of approach your life and think about others? Yeah, yeah, it has uh, dramatically because um, I, I don't know this, I'm, I'm in a fairly lucky position, I think. I, I do, I've managed to earn a living doing something I enjoy doing uh, and I've done quite well over the years so I've got, I've got enough actually. Um, and I, I kind of thought well, it's a bit odd that uh, I meet quite a lot of people who, who are, are very rich already. And, and yet I still see them stressing about money and stressing about uh, the deals that they're doing with different TV companies and this kind of thing. You kind of think, you know, what, are you, what are you worrying about? You don't, you don't need any more at all. You've got so much more than everyone else. Um, and so I decided that I was going to stop doing... I was basically just going to give myself a pretty much a basic wage uh, and then give everything else away or sort of set things up or try and do things. As I started a charity, Tennis for Free, where we try and get people playing tennis in parks on Saturday morning. I, I volunteer. I'm a free I do free coaching on Saturday mornings, put energy into that. I, the second book I did, Playing the Moldovans at Tennis, uh, the royalties of the book started a care centre in Moldova. I've made a film of playing the Moldovans at tennis. I bet some of them could rip your ass at tennis. The footballers? Rubbish. All right, then. I bet you that you couldn't beat the Moldovans. Tony, wait. You're saying if you lose this bet, you have to strip naked and sing the Moldovan national anthem in front of the tube station? Yeah. Listen, this is an odd one, but I have to go to Moldova. What? I have to beat the entire Moldovan national football team at tennis, one by one. You are very optimistic. It's always a good idea to have a visual picture of what your challenge is. This is a list of the players that you need to play. Sounds easy. Should be out of here within the week. What did he say? He said that he doesn't speak English. You want to play Oleg Shishkin at tennis? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Moldovans would just chill a bit. I think Tony will win his bed. I do not see how you will succeed. 
Not to risk anything is to risk everything. What does that mean? Yeah, I was hoping you weren't going to ask that. It's coming out this summer during the Wimbledon Championship, and I've made that, funded that with my own money, using amazing Moldovan actors, and we're really pleased with the, the result, and we're going to do... That'll come out in June, and all the profits from that are going to go to the care centre. And people say, oh, that's really great, and that's really generous. And, but it isn't that much of a sacrifice for me. I'm not really giving up very much. You know, I'm still... Got, I can still go and have a nice meal. I can. Uh, so I think it's. I think people. I see people become greedy when they don't need to be, and I don't even think they're greedy people. It's a funny thing. I just think the society is saying to them, "Have more, buy more, and even be be more competitive with your somebody else." So I think comedians or TV performers or actors, they're thinking, "How much is that person getting?" I want to get more than them. So I do think it's a shame that more people, when they reach a certain level of wealth, if you like, aren't, it isn't made easier for them, actually. So this is a, yeah. uh, I had the privilege of being in a sort of discussion at a festival in Brighton with Tony once when um, the discussion got turned to inequality. We were talking about things that make society happy or unhappy. And Tony had a quite interesting theory on, obviously, inequality being quite a big driver of unhappiness, but what was your... What was well, your I, I, it was, we, we were there, weren't we, with a Tory MP. I can't remember. Which one was it? The one that calls himself Mr... David right, Willits. David Willits, yeah. yeah he, uh, and he was there. And um, I, I sort of wanted to run... <laughs> I launched my little policy, in a way, which I do... I, I've never done anything with this, but and I thought it might be quite fun to run it by you. It, it's a theory... My, my policy, when I become Prime Minister, or if, or if we all arrange a coup tonight... Um, <laughs> led by Andy on sound, um, <laughs> at the front with the megaphone. Uh, <laughs> the idea would be that once you've earned 10 times the national average, um, you have to, by law, give everything away to a charity of your choice or set up your own charity. Now, uh, the thinking behind this is research actually shows that once you reach a certain level of wealth, it doesn't make you any happier. If you try to tax the hell out of very wealthy people, and the, the, they're going to say, look, we didn't vote for this government, we don't want this money being spent on that, we don't spend it, and they, they sort of leave the country pissed off, basically. It doesn't work. But if you say, you're in charge of how you spend that money, but we don't think it's very healthy for you to buy another car or another yacht or another and we don't think it's very healthy for us in general and if it's not healthy for us in general how can it be healthy for you people just build the, the walls higher bring in other alarm systems i think a measure of how happy uh, culture is is how many people there are in the prisons really how many offenders are there are as neil who wrote the book Summerhill about uh, schooling years ago. I think there's a lovely paragraph in it where he just said something along the lines of no happy person ever steals anything or insults anybody or attacks anybody. Happy people don't offend. That, that is the truth of it. Daily Mail re readers might not be believe that, but they know it in the, and they're just told it every day. They're told, told it. I'm just rambling now. Should I keep rambling? <laughs> no, I love it. Who, who, who likes Tony's idea on, uh, on income I'm on, distribution? I'm on, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, do we have a, do we find another microphone, Andy? Was there a microphone in the audience anywhere? Because I'd love to take some <laughs> questions from the floor. Have we got one? No? Well, I'm well, going yeah, to... Sh shout yeah. it out or you go down or whatever. Oh. Who, who fancies, a show of hands, who'd like to ask Tony a question about his journey, about anything we've talked about tonight? Gentleman at the front. There is another one, is there, Andy, somewhere? No, no, right, that one, that's fine, okay. Good. I like the way he said, are there any microphones on the floor, as if he'd expected you all to bring your own microphone. <laughs> you use that one, go on. Hi. Lazy, go on. That was great. Um, I haven't seen the film, read the book, so a quick question on a philosophical point, mm. if I may. Yeah in these august surroundings, it's appropriate. Where is that fridge now? Is it langu languishing, broken-hearted, dumped somewhere? That's the question. The other is, it struck me that 
Initially, the fridge looks like an impediment to your journey, but turns out to be a catalyst that makes things happen. Yes. And as you know, a catalyst doesn't actually change, but it causes change. So I thought we could ask ourselves, what should be my fridge <laughs> on my journey from birth to death? Have I got one? If not, what do I acquire? What is my fridge in life? That's going to make a difference. <laughs> Security. Uh, no, I totally agree with you. I, I, I think it is. It's, I love the fact that it, it, it is sort of slight. It is mad. You know, the adventure was mad and people were... But it, there is a kind of bizarre sanity to it that if you can find something, you know, some metaphor for something, it can help ease the... But I suppose in a way, to some extent, you know, religion offers that to people. The trouble is... There's a sort of darker side to that that goes with it. That, that, that you know, the fridge tended not to dictate to me who I slept with and who I didn't, uh, and or various other, or what food I ate, or it didn't. There were hardly any rules that the fridge dictated to me. Um, so I, I, I'm not advocating that. But I think, in a way, we can get a, a sort of. Uh, a lightening of the load, but even just by saying, oh, it'll be all right because of something, whatever you're... For, it, it, the, this is an interesting point, and it was a part of the dialogue that we didn't hear, was um, when the fridge was surfing, I picked up on this line that had happened after the book and put it into the film script. Uh, and I was at a, bo a book talk um, and talking about the, this, playing the Moldovans at tennis, where I took on the entire Moldovan national football team at tennis, one by one, and went off and did that. Ended up in Albania try, trying to do a duet with Norman Wisdom for another book, for another... And I was doing crazy things, and this bloke put his hand up and said, yeah, I've got a question for you. Don't you think you're a bit mad? Um, and I just genuinely, off the top of my head, said, well, I don't... Actually, I don't think I am mad. I think I'm sane, and everyone else is mad really, which is a true sign of madness in a way. But I suppose what I was trying to say from that is, if you are doing what you enjoy doing in a carefree way, that's not, you know, I think in a way, what sometimes what people believe to be sanity is a kind of madness, which is to be caught in some sort of financial trap, which means that you have to do a job that you don't like uh, and that you don't have any choice and that you're going to spend most of your life doing that to have some material things that won't bring you any happiness necessarily anyway, or if they do, only very short-lived. And then you'll reach a point where you'll perhaps retire and then be pissed off because the economical situation is such that that's not worth anywhere near what you thought it was going to be worth. And that supposedly is sanity. Um, and I think we as a society or as a culture, as a, as a world in the West, have started to live with the idea that sanity is, is that. And in fact, it's a kind of insanity. And, and it's sold to us and it's pushed to us. And it's pushed by teachers who actually are suffering from it. And we teach it to children and we teach them to be fearful about the future. The other, my, other, my other big bugbear is examinations. You know, what the hell are we examining kids for relentlessly? so that they can then go into this world and get on this treadmill and do this thing and they're not able to express themselves and do all those things. And th these sort of mad things that, that we're doing will stop once I lead you all to... F oh, sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, didn't answer the key thing. The, the key thing, the fridge is at home and sits on top of my real fridge. Uh, so... <laughs> So I see it every day and pay little homage to it and everything like that. So it's, it's still there. There was another one. Uh, there was a gentleman here. When you're feeling a little bit crap and down, as we all do sometimes, what do you do to make yourself feel happy again? Um, well, I've got a little test I do. Whenever I start to feel a bit sorry for myself or whatever, I, I've got a little thing. It does. I think it works nearly all the time. And I just say, who am I thinking of now? Uh, and the answer is always me. Um, and I, it's understandable, you know, it's quite, <laughs> I'm quite important to me in a way. But if you want to break yourself out of that, I think you can go, well, if I stop thinking about me quite so much now, well, that starts to lift, or the cloud lifts immediately, actually. Um, and I do believe that, that human beings, although people say, or 
we've got this instinct that we need to look after ourselves and we, you know it's kind of the selfish gene if you like all that but i actually think our initial instinct is to help others if somebody falls over next to us we instinctively reach to pull them up and help them and i don't think that people when they're in the act of helping somebody else can be unhappy i think that they they may still have unhappiness that they may return to but i think in that moment when they're doing that i don't think they're unhappy and i think that's what we've lost sight of and we don't know how to do it anymore and i don't know the answer of how you how you bring that back in to uh, a culture but i think it's starting to be recognized now and and i do think actually you know we're the way we bring kids up is we, we, we get them to become absorbed in themselves. We get them to become absorbed in what they're going to have. Christmas, I'm very radical on this, I believe Christmas is bad for children. I think it turns them into little consumers. I think I, I can remember going to school and kids were coming back and they were saying, what did you get for Christmas? Oh, I got this and I got that. And people were comparing what they had and all this thing. I think it's parents are having to compare to try and earn enough money to buy these little buggers the things that they want that are so expensive it's tough and, it, and I don't know how that happened and it crept through and, and it's like I, you know I'm sort of seem to be a, I haven't spoken out about it publicly before <laughs> but when I do talk, tell people they just say oh you curmudgeon you this and that but I, there's another side to it which is Christmas American consumers and capitalists sold Christmas to us as this thing where you have to give presents and buy all these things and everything like that. So I think we've lost track of that. And when you're caught in that moment where the dark moment, the fed up moment, you can just ask yourself the question, who am I thinking of now? Tony, you've just told us things you do if you're down and we've heard about this sort of greater purpose, the fridge in life. Are there things that you do, just little things that you make a habit of that are, contribute towards happiness? Yes, I mean, I, I don't know. I imagine quite a lot of people here will have been at talks and been at things where, where meditation is sort of recommended as being a thing that, that you should do. And, and I, try, I do try to do that, but I probably, I suspect I might be like a lot of people here, uh, not very good at doing it. Um, I, I, I tried to do it this morning and I ended up just thinking about lots of things I could say tonight, none of which I happen to have said. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think that's a good thing at least to try and do. But I think that the most important thing of all is actually even to be aware that there's something that you can do is such an important thing. I think so many people are kind of lost in, in a world where it's just running away with them. You know, they're not in control of it. They want to be in control, and yet they're not in control of anything. The only thing that you're ever really in control of in life is how you choose to react to what has happened. So you can be running around trying to say, I'll try and organize this. We were trying to set up the stuff earlier, weren't we? And, and, <laughs> and Mark said, if there's no sound, you know, will it be a disaster? And I said, Probably if the building falls down on us, it'll be a disaster. In fact, the sound was a disaster, and yet it wasn't a disaster. I still like Andy. He's not so sure about me. <laughs> no. Um, so, it, it, oh, hang on. There, there you are. Yes. Um, ex exactly that. Yes, we, we, we can't be in control, but we can observe what we're doing up here with the thinking, and I think that's what the meditation, however badly done, can get you to do you can just become an observer of yourself and I've, I've I've another little thing that I tried to do is I don't somebody asked me what my ambition was a, a few years ago and my, I said my ambition is never to be angry again um, and I haven't you know succeeded it and I wasn't a particularly angry person anyway but just didn't want to get annoyed um, unfortunately I had to take out insurance on the phone with somebody recently <laughs> And I let myself down because <laughs> it was so frustrating. And they kept putting me on hold and then coming back. And that technology, that world, you know. So, uh, but again, I hauled myself around. There's an interesting thing. I thought the duck egg man was interesting to me because he was a, he was a shopkeeper, essentially. Now, there are a lot of places in the world where you go and you see people who are very proud of, of what they do. And he, he was obviously proud of what he did and he liked it. 
I think sometimes we live in a culture where people are doing a job where they think this is a shit job. Um, and, and, you know, I think sometimes you just have to do a job. I, we're all very privileged, and I'm unbelievably privileged to live in a, a country where we're wealthy enough to be able to pay me to ponce around, basically. You know, I'm the icing on the cake, if you like, of, a, of, a, of an economy that's got enough leftover money to be able to pay people to entertain them and not to have to do anything else. If I lived in an African village somewhere, I could have the same talents that I've got, but I'd still have to work as hard as everybody else. Friday evening, they might sort of say, do a bit of a turn, and they might give you Friday afternoon off or something. I don't know. There might be some privilege I could wangle somehow. <laughs> um, but the, the reality of it is we do have to work. We all have to get together. To, to the problem comes when people think, well, what are we working for? Uh, they think that they're kind of working for someone else who's making all the money, who's not sharing it with them, because it's true. We live in a world where there are un obscenely wealthy people. America is, a, is, is an obscene country in a, in a way because the, the multi, multi, multi millionaires, and there are ghettos in most of the cities there. You don't see that in most of the TV shows that you see, you know, it glosses over it. Hollywood mostly glosses over that. Interestingly, shows a lot of the heroes in Hollywood films are living in mansions and have all this stuff and, uh, and, 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 and people aspire to it. And so I think work is good. I think simple work is good and I, I think we should do it. And the trick is to say, when I'm doing my job, how am I being of service to other people? And if I can't do that, then I'll do the best I can till I can get another job. And unquestionably, there are people in the world who are slaves, really. You know, the, the people who are working in sweatshops around the world and enabling me to buy this sweater for, for well, we all, let's face it, we all know, $8.99. Um, <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, we're all, it's just an unfair world, but we've got to start somewhere. And I, I think, you know, doing what we're doing and talking about what we're doing and thinking about what we're doing is a start. And a, and I'd like to see a sort of movement grow so that politicians listen to this sort of voice. Um, because the trouble is, I've met quite a few politicians, and some of them are, are nice and good people, but they get swept away in the same way that everyone else does, because they, I've seen them all moving around in, in Westminster, and, and they like the, the money that they get, and they like the, the life that they have, and they like the restaurants, and they like the this, and they, you know, they become... They're reflections of us in a way. So when we change, I think our politicians may change and we may actually elect people who are going to be of service to us and will be of service to them, etc., etc. I bet you, <laughs> £120, yeah. that you can't get yourself elected as an M independent MP in the next five <laughs> years. I might take you up on that, I think. Uh, it's... Um, it has crossed my mind, actually. I did, I did think of maybe standing at the next election. So I'll get your name at the end, because I quite need £120. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I, I like the idea of standing on that one single issue, so that you go... And, but then I'd sort of be interested... I'd obviously want to try and do it somewhere where I didn't... Uh, because we have this bizarre electoral system where... You know, I, I might stand and get, you know, 940 votes and then, the, the, you know, I could keep out a good politician um, and a bastard could get in because of my 940 votes. But um, I'd probably need more if I was going to get elected, I've just realised. Um, uh, it's an interesting idea. I don't think I could possibly get elected, but it, it'd be nice to get some of those issues talked about because I don't hear them talked about. I don't know who... I think... I don't know about you guys, but... I feel disenfranchised even though I'm not disenfranchised because there's, I've got nobody to vote for. There's nobody to vote for. Now, the Green Party, I think, would, I would probably... I'd put my cross there, and I do... Hands up, I need to read up more on, on, on the Green Party. But I'd, of, of the politicians that we got, you know, it's, the message isn't there. And, and, a, and a, a sort of... We are drifting towards... Um, uh, we could be drifting towards something not very nice if we don't do something about this because we're using up all the Earth resources uh, in order to keep growing. And what for? You know, it's a thing of something else. But uh, certainly, if we were to, get to, to, to put a load of money back into a pot 
that, that, you know, just think how big that charity sector would become if everybody was, was giving to it. Think of all the jobs that would be created. Think of all the movement, all the, all the good that would be seen and be happening. And if it was no longer uh, something that, you know, the, the sign of doing well was how rich you were, it would be incredible. And I, so I think, you know, the lottery is, 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 a, is a symbol to me of what's wrong with our society is that, that so many people want to win it. They want, they want, they see their happiness as coming from something that they, that, that is just material wealth. They don't even think that they need to create it in order, they just want to put their thing. And then they also want to be much, much richer than everybody else. And it, it's, it's obscene in a way. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the idea of a lottery as long as you all win 500 quid. Um, but that doesn't work. If you sell lottery tickets to people and say, we'll have 600,000 winners with win 500 pound each, apparently nobody buys the tickets. It's incredible. So that, what does that say about how we're all thinking and how our culture is? So um, in answer to your question, we'll exchange details at the end. And uh, when's the next general election happening? A couple of years? Something like that. Yeah, so we'll keep in touch, meet weekly, and uh, <laughs> take it from there. <laughs>